I was eight years old, I'd often found my mom on the bathroom floor moaning with menstrual pain, waiting for her painkillers to kick in. And she'd often say, I need to go now and follow my duties as a teacher. Now I can see that society at large had never been supportive of her as a single working mom, but also she had never learned to be in touch with her own needs, ignoring and pushing her body to its limits. From the age of 17 until my mid-twenties, I went onto the pill, just as doctors prescribed to many young women. And while the pill can be helpful for some, I wasn't provided with much information what it was that I was putting into my body and its long-term effects on my hormone and energy levels, which started to be strongly affected. Throughout my twenties, I worked in different jobs, suffering intense menstrual pain. And I would keep myself going with painkillers, suffering through the day, whilst trying to keep a professional demeanor. I was often told by my employers of all genders to drug myself and keep going. I have friends who have lost their jobs due to being absent too often because of their menstrual experiences, which they couldn't communicate sufficiently to their employers. And when I was 29, I started to learn about the menstrual cycle and its power in more depth and everything started changing for me. When 33, I set up an NGO to educate young girls about their natural bodily experiences and to help navigate questions around growing up. So what do these little peeks into my younger self's experiences tell you? We see a mom that pushed herself to exhaustion, a young woman accepting the pill without a question, relying on painkillers at work. My story is very, very common, unfortunately. When I started to learn about my body through yoga, meditation and research into the menstrual cycle, it started to dawn on me that these experiences I'm describing to you, whilst normal, shouldn't be normalized. My research highlighted to me that my natural bodily experiences were not honored by the society that I lived in. And my right to be in charge of my body wasn't a priority either. And this does not meet my vision of a fulfilled life. In my research of menstruation, I have also found that half of the young women in the UK, aged 14 to 21, are embarrassed by their periods. 64% have missed a sports lesson because of it and 52% have made up a lie or excuse why they weren't able to partake. Their periods. And not much really is different in the adult world where 23% of women have taken time off because of their periods and 36% have made up a lie or excuse. The most common reasons given having the flu, a cold or a stomach bug. And there are many occasions where menstrual cycle experiences can be problematic to many menstruators in the workplace. A woman shared online that she was sent home from the office because the hot water bottle in her lab was unprofessional and had made a male co-worker extremely uncomfortable. The director of HR ordered her personally to take leave after the co-worker had complained and she was said to disclose not to disclose her medical problems to anyone. Menstruation is still one of the biggest taboos cross-culturally stretching through all layers of society. I do believe that we cannot create equal and wholesome lives where these toxic attitudes towards female bodies are being upheld and reinforced day by day. And each and every one of us contributes to the upholding of the taboo, be that through white lies, through calling our co-worker or fellow student hormonal or periods gross, or through being silent about our experiences altogether. So today I'm going to present you with five taboo measures that I will hope will help to shift these sticky mindsets. And I'm starting with a little heritage lesson. Did you know how the taboo started? Once upon a time, the menstrual cycle and menstruation were a sign 
of power and honor in many cultures. And that started to shift about 5,000 years ago, when matrilineal European cultures were overturned with the influence of the church. Witch hunts changed the picture of power in Europe and not for the better for many menstruators. Beliefs were still installed in society that kept everyone afraid of this natural bodily function. Here's a scripture from 65 AD about menstruation. But nothing could easily be found that is more remarkable than the monthly flux of women. It starts promising. Contact with it turns new wine sour. Crops touched by it become barren. Seeds and gardens dry. The fruit of tree falls off. The bright surface of mirrors in which it is merrily reflected is dimmed. The edge of steel and the gleam of ivory is dulled. Hives of bees will die. And it goes on. So sadly, menstruators started to believe this themselves. Menstruators, by the way, is a term I'm using to describe everyone who has had and will experience menstrual cycles in their lives. So menstruation was deemed impure and people were cut off from the knowledge about their amazing bodies. And our modern world here in 2020 is built on these pillars of injustice and toxic beliefs. We might not claim that menstruation makes wine go sour anymore, but each and every one of us contributes to the taboo and we all inherited negative beliefs and behaviors towards menstruation, often unconsciously passed down from one generation to the next. Half of the world's population is experiencing menstrual cycles right now, dear audience, and it is our sheer reason for existing. Your moms have them, your sisters and even the queen back in the day had periods. In other words, if nobody menstruated, none of you would be sitting here and watching this talk and you also couldn't do the favorite things that you love to do. Be that playing football in the park with your mates, nerding out about Game of Thrones or doing all the other wonderful stuff that you love to do. And that's truly amazing. Think about it. So meet the wonders of the cycling body. The menstrual cycle lasts between 25 and 35 days, but everyone is different. It consists of four different phases, distinct like the seasons. And the phase most of us are familiar with is menstruation, the bleeding time, which starts on day one of the menstrual cycle. Did you know that menstruators all together bleed about six years of their lives? This is a huge chunk of time. Throughout the different cycle phases, different hormones and energy levels are present. And hormones, as you might know, influence almost everything in the body. They influence the way we feel in our physical bodies, the way we feel emotionally, and even the way our brain processes information and the way we act in the world. So it is subtly influencing every aspect of life, our relationships, family life, work and school life, and even health and so on. But there's more to it than just bleeding. It is called a cycle for a reason. There are three more cycle phases. After menstruation, up to mid-cycle, Many menstruators feel that they are more energized, more productive and on top of things. And it's likely that they're experiencing their pre-ovulation or ovulation phase. Our society is really fond of this. In the second half of the cycle, after ovulation, energy naturally declines. And some might feel this drop and judge it as not functioning as normal, but it is actually really natural that menstruators feel more moody inwards and reflective. Actually, in the premenstrual phase, 
phase number three. Our right hemisphere of the brain, which is associated with intuitive knowing, is more active than the left hemisphere of the brain, which is our rational brain. And guess how society likes that? All of this happens for roughly 40 years over and over again, every month for half of the world's population. Which brings me to my first point, my first taboo smasher. Learn about cycles. I have observed how many people with menstrual cycles push themselves unnecessary and burn out. I actively challenge the belief that menstruators need to function in the same capacities throughout the month. Some ideas. What you can do when your energy declines is to take the pace off a little bit. Charting cycles and moods is a tool that young people should be introduced to and to learn about self-care to understand what they need and how they can support others. Ultimately, we need to start respecting our bodies and stand up for ourselves. Number two, do real talk and be vulnerable. So being vulnerable means to be kind, open and to share our experiences. The Me Too movement encouraged so many to speak up about their very personal experiences of sexual harassment. And it helped to create awareness where before there was ignorance. I want to see the same courage people speaking up about menstrual cycle experiences to create long-lasting positive change and to create better support systems for everyone in schools, in the workplace and in our private lives. The need is growing for open and ongoing conversations between all genders to understand what is really going on for us underneath and to find ways to be compassionate and understanding towards each other. Number three, stop shaming and see what we have in common. And with that I mean stop shaming others for their menstrual cycle experiences and stop shaming yourself. Ultimately, menstrual cycle experiences influence everyone and affect everyone. So to normalize these, we really need to stop shaming our co-workers or fellow students or friends for being hormonal or on the rag or by simply using a hot water bottle. We all experience different emotions, changing emotions, changing energy levels, and we all have different bodies. So we need to start being more patient and understanding of other people's needs as well as our own. Number four, help to create a positive menstrual culture. And that doesn't have to mean talking about cycles all the time. It is about creating better conditions for everyone. I truly believe that cultural change starts with us and how we choose to live our lives and interact with the world will ultimately change the world. And how do we create a culture that is more friendly to all menstruators? For example, by having menstrual products available in all schools and businesses to introduce young people to what is available and how to use them. If you're a friend or an employer, stay open to the challenges of your friends or employees. If you are a business, maybe an anonymous poll for your employers is a nice idea to understand their needs. There are already modern businesses who model period leave and that have implemented supportive self-care policies for their employees. So let's do more of this. And remember, the menstrual cycle comes with different energy levels and capacities. Maybe workplaces can start making use of these different energy levels and capacities to create better working conditions and a more effective way of working. Number five, be a role model and change the story. 
How do we model a healthy adult to the next generation? Fact is, kids pick up on our behaviors all the time. And in my work with young people, I understand that for a young girl getting her first period is a big deal. And it is often accompanied by unnecessary embarrassment, anxiety and worry. And the picture doesn't have to look like this. I feel very inspired by the words of Jane Bennett and Karen Pickering. They say, when girls are taught to see their bodies as incredible and powerful, we can break cycles of body hatred and low self-esteem. When women are able to inhabit their bodies with dignity and pride, they can make better choices for themselves, expect more from their relationships and to fully come into their power. So how can you be the change maker in your own life? I believe that every little conversation you have about the subject and every little everyday activism adds fuel to a culture in which people can strive. And really, we need everyone involved. I'm part of a growing movement of people that speak up for an equal and wholesome life. And I gained the courage to point out injustices. I believe you can do the same. A famous German poet once said, courage is a commitment to begin with no guarantee of success. I do wish you courage and thank you very much.